Uh, welcome to the second killer video app think tank, think tank session this afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Is this, oh, okay. Hi there. That's much better. Welcome everybody to the second killer app think tank session of the day. Uh, we have a terrific panel, many of whom that many of whom who have launched and or managed video destination sites. Um, what I'd like to cover today is some of the breadth of their experience. Uh, some of them have been along for a while, others are no longer with us. Um, and we'd like to explore what worked, why, how did they adapt to changes in user behavior? How did they change their uh, revenue models? What type of strategies did they begin to deploy to secure uh, distribution, to uh, increase their user base, and to get eyeballs? So um, in the video content world, we know there are a lot of things that are beyond our control. They, can to, they include content owners, license fees, celebrities, and in certain cases, corporate agendas. Um, on the panel today, I think each of the panelists had experience with one or more of these uh, renegade variables. And um, I'd like to ask them how they evolved. So um, Dick, I actually wanted to start with you. Um, first of all, let, let's have the panelists introduce themselves and give a little brief, a uh, few remarks on your uh, webs websites. Sure. Um, I'm Dick Glover, uh, the president and CEO of Funny or Die. Um, and, and I would sort of comment, we certainly don't look at ourselves as a website. We have a website that's part of our business. It's obviously a very important part of our business. But we look at ourselves as really what the 21st century studio model is in a narrowly defined uh, niche in that we own content distribution, social media and marketing uh, in a vertically integrated way. We keep the cost of content low, the cost of marketing low, and therefore are able to keep uh, margins hopefully high. Tyler? I'm going to be a little shorter than Dick. I looked up Dick's LinkedIn profile. He said, if you talk to Dick, be very short and concise. Because <laughs> um, he isn't. So I, I run Buzz Media, which is a digital publisher. Uh, we uh, publish 34 different properties in the pop culture space. It's good to be in LA. We, you guys will actually know some of our names. So we publish uh, a lot of properties in the music space where we started and a couple years ago entered into the celebrity news and entertainment area. Uh, properties like the Superficial, um, Celeb Buzz, BuzzNet, Idolater, Egotastic, etc. Um, and we've been at it for about six years um, in the digital publishing space. I've done a couple different digital publishing business on the web. As Dick can attest to, I'm sure the other panelists, building your own content is a much longer term, more challenging proposition. And I think there's been very little value in the ecosystem so far today to content. More of the businesses have been focused on things like platform building on the software side. And then to the extent it's been on the media side, it's been more about arbitrage uh, and, and, and representation and other things get scaled faster. So uh, happy to dive into the content part of it. Cool, I, I already talked about myself, Jim Lauderback, Revision 3. We make shows for 18 to 34 year old guys and uh, distributing them out around the net. We're big on YouTube, we're big on all those devices. So I'm, uh, I'm Moby Dick. <laughs> I'm the guy that's got the harpoons and the uh, dead bodies hanging off him after 30 years being in this industry. Not on that profile as I used to be at HBO in the days when there was no original programming and helped start up the entertainment television. I was part of that first team. And then you saw some of the other stuff, Sky New Zealand. That was the first time New Zealand ever had pay TV. And Foxtel Australia, first time Australians ever had pay TV. And then Open TV, somebody said Interact TV never happened. Well, there's things going on in other parts of the world, not the United States, where it actually has taken hold, like at B Sky B. And then C Core, which with all the boxes of flashing lights that began video on demand in the United States with the cable operators, and then Zillion TV. And it's all that stuff before that led to Zillion, which didn't make it. And there are a lot of reasons for that, which we'll discuss. Yes. But uh, Zillion, initially, it, the, the goal was a whole new ecosystem for television which we see today in the forms of Hulu and Netflix streaming. And I remember being in a meeting once where a, a VC pointed at me and said, you're gonna blow up the internet. And that was the end of 2006, beginning of 2007. It was very, very early days. And the idea was to give the consumer a great experience with a great interface 
that allowed them on demand to watch television shows, movies, either they could pay for it or they could watch for free with ads that were self-selected, and you could even do commerce. It was a very big idea, and unfortunately it just didn't make it, and we can talk about that later. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, I actually had planned to start, as I had said earlier, with Dick, but uh, uh, Zillion TV is a very interesting experiment in um, OTT, and given that we had just seen a presentation of Google TV earlier, and I don't know if any of you have taken a look at their uh, uh, demo set up outside, but one of the most interesting things is that um, televisions that are not pre-installed with the application, um, users will have to buy a box. And I know that that was integral to the Zillion TV offering. So um, my question is, you know, people talk about the resistance to an additional box in the environment. Um, you certainly hit the press, I would say, with a lot of fanfare, mm -hmm. studio partners, yes. VC funding, and over the top box, set-top box, what element worked for you and what finally took Zillion TV down? So uh, you actually hit the, the, the reason why I went down. Um, one of the partners that uh, you didn't mention was a credit card company, which you go on names right now, but uh, uh, they and I had agreed, I, I knew from being in the industry for all these years that selling set-top boxes was not the way to go. I've been selling boxes dishes, antennas, aerials my entire adult life. And so when I was starting Zillion, the idea was to take the box out of the equation. Again, you have to go back in time, you know, 2006, 2007, there was no Hulu, Voodoo, Doodoo, and the rest of them, you know? It, there was nobody streaming television like that, like we were talking about. So, but I needed a box. There were no connected TVs then. Uh, so I went to this credit card company and had cut a deal with them to subsidize those boxes for yeah, $150. You were going to give them away for free, free. correct? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what happened was, you know, this is, you know, as some of you people here know, it. this is the first time I've been around in a year because my wife just passed away from cancer. And I, so I've been kind of out of it for a while. And it's been made, it's, it's helped give me time to be very reflective about a lot of things, this being one of them. You know, things happen to us in life where you just, you're not in control of it. This was one of them. Who knew that the recession was going to hit in 2008? Yeah. And this credit card company is an association of banks. The banks went under, and away went my subsidy. So and if you take $150 times even 100,000 homes, you know, with the kind of money I was raising, there's no way I would be able to get to market like that on my own. So um, I'd like to actually ask the panel as a segue from the set-top box conversation and what Google is doing. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was uh, looking at the demo was uh, the number of um, icons featured on the lower menu bar. And uh, people often talk about that in this increasingly crowded world, there's only so much space on a guide or a home page or a front page. And how is it that some of your web properties are going to uh, make themselves known to the user and distinguish themselves from higher, more recognizable brands such as Hulu, Netflix, YouTube, the ones that are blockbusters coming on now that are going to be more prominently featured. What, how, how do you make yourself heard in that space? Um, let's start with Diggs. And you use the word, it's all about brand. And for us, that's why I say we're not a website company. We, yeah. we are a company and a brand. And the brand stands for something. People know right away what it is know what you're going to get, um, and that that's how you break through the clutter. That uh, it, It's one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, there's been a, uh, an, an awful lot of talk about uh, original programming being distributed via the web and this, that, and the other. Um, and the question, the real question is really simple. Is anything going to come of it? Are there going to be good brands that are developed that mean something? because that's ultimately what it's about. If you got the greatest distribution for the worst brand or a non-entity brand, it's meaningless. Um, in the same way they always used to say, you know, there's nothing worse than good marketing for a bad product. There's nothing worse than good distribution for a bad piece of content. Right, and how did you establish, uh, how would, what would you credit with the, the success that Funny or Die has had in establishing itself as a brand? Clearly you have celebrity backing uh, Will Ferrell's a recognized, popular uh, comedian. Um, how much did that play into your success? And is it key and critical to have a recognized professional 
uh, entertainer involved, or do these, some of these uh, emerging talents that are just you know, publicizing themselves on the, on the web, uh, on YouTube, I should say, um, equally as effective in distinguishing a given brand in this crowded space? Again, it, it gets back to quality, not name or, or backing or, or any of the sort. I, I like to think that we've uh, had success because some very, very talented people have worked really, really hard and have produced some really good stuff. Um, Tyler, um, you know, I read uh, uh, recently that um, um, you have, well, you, you mentioned yourself, you have over uh, 40 or is it 40 uh, uh, brands that you are managing online under for Buzz Media? Um, when you and I last got together, and I asked how you asked you how it was going, you said, "Thank God for Kim Kardashian." <laughs> so, um, you know, Kim Kardashian has been as effective as perhaps Will Ferrell or anyone else on the web in helping people find celeb. Um, media, for example. I, Could you I, I agree with Dick. That? I actually don't think so. I, I, I think that what I think there were a couple of pieces about the web that led to some interesting investments early on. But I agree with Dick that the web is more similar to other mediums and it's different, and that there will be a much more finite group of brands that drive consumer experiences. And I, I think you can see at least what we see in the pop culture space, which is uh, you first started off with portals as kind of a gateway to find what you want on the web, and then it turned into search. But when people evolve into their experiences and they like them and the brand delivers, and I think that's the big question is what does it mean to deliver for a brand on the web because it's very different than other mediums. But when it delivers, people come back over and over again. And many of our sites, the average visit per month is around 200 visits per month. And so we manage a big port. We publish all of these sites and we, we, we sort of see not all the brands have the same equal brand strength. But a big determinant when we look at them is how much of that audience is coming back directly, direct domain, and how many times a month and how many times a day are they coming back for that experience. Those are the strongest brands. And the, the ones that deliver on that content experience around that topic win. I think search is sort of a poor man's uh, programming vehicle. You don't really go on your TV guide every night and say, what am I gonna watch? You generally have a defined the branded experiences that you care about in your different topics, whether you're gonna watch HBO on Sunday or you're gonna watch Sports Center at nine o'clock. And the same thing I think is happening on the web. It's taken longer because the amount of investment in content has been much lower. But I think that's where it's happening over time. And so when we look at our sites, about 70% of our traffic comes direct domain, meaning people have bookmarked it or direct typing it in. 20% comes from search, and that's actually the fastest growing, and 10% comes from search. Now part of that is we're probably not really good at search, but I think it's mostly that people have, that have identified with these brands yeah. and are coming back for that experience over and over again. So Kim Kardashian, is an important person to have programming if you're programming a topic called Kim Kardashian. Mm -hmm. But there are a thousand, I used to, I mean, I ran a business before in sports, Dick and I were talking about a little earlier, we ran all the sites for all the athletes pretty much in the world. If you don't do a good Kobe Bryant site, there's a thousand fan sites that do a really good job. Um, the other part is what is a good Kobe Bryant site? Is Kobe Bryant a big enough topic to build a business around? But that's separate. So, I think the idea that there's a lot of people are raising money around a celebrity's gonna do this or celebrity's gonna do that, it's not about that, it's about mm -hmm. the topic and are you programming well against that topic all the time, which is what people demand in digital. Yes. Um, so the, the reason I brought up Moby Dick is when you've been, when you're old enough like me, you've been around long enough, you see history repeat itself. This is going back to the early 1980s at HBO. Um, I was a young marketing executive at the time and I was getting phone calls uh, by irate consumers or cable operators who are saying, hey Mitch, you know, we've seen Batman 19 times this month on HBO, which would sprung the original programming bin by Chris Albrecht. And I was there during the whole thing, I watched it. And this is just, this time right now that we're all going through is just like that, but just in a bigger scope. Because my problem at HBO was I had these basic customers, basic cable customers who hadn't upgraded to HBO yet. And I also had people who had HBO who was gonna disconnect because they perceived that there wasn't enough value because we, they were seeing the same thing over and over and over again because there's not enough mm -hmm. tier one content to get everybody happy. So we had to find a way to cut through all the clutter, all these new channels that were coming to cable and get people to focus on HBO and create original programs that nobody had ever heard of before. Nobody had ever heard of Sex in the City or The Sopranos or Six Feet Under or Deadwood or Band of Brothers. How do you get people to go there and then come back or oh. engage over and over and over again? It's, it's what's going on and what, from my point of view, 
that I see, what's going on right now on, on the internet, uh, 